Hello everybody, I'm Dr. David Alfonso, board certified plastic surgeon. I've been in practice for about 16 years now and my surgical practice focuses on purely aesthetic surgery and all aspects including breast, body, and facial surgery as well. I'd like to welcome all of you to our body contouring webinar. I'm really excited to be able to talk with all of you about new technology and new techniques that enhance results as well as recovery. So the format for the webinar is going to follow uh, in regards to discussing the techniques and procedures that are most common, as well as having the opportunity for some live Q&A for patients that have questions about any of the topics that I've discussed uh, this afternoon. So many of you may be wondering what the term body contouring means. It's really quite broad and it's, the, it's that way on purpose. Patients come to see me for a variety of areas. It can be anywhere from arms to breasts or abdominal area, as well as down to the thighs and even the knees. So body contouring encompasses a wide array of surgical procedures and a wide array of areas, but the theme overriding is that we want to improve the shape and contour of those areas for patients, many of whom have had weight loss uh, or changes to their body through pregnancy and childbearing. So I'm very excited to talk to you about a lot of the specific techniques that I utilize and our office utilizes in order to get incredibly good results and minimize the downtime. When we talk about the most common surgery that I see patients for after pregnancy as well as weight loss, it's called an abdominoplasty, also termed a tummy tuck. Those are pretty much interchangeable terms for the same surgery, which involve removing skin in the abdomen and sometimes the waist area, in addition to tightening up the deeper layer of muscles, which are typically stretched out with pregnancy and weight gain and weight loss. So some of the neat advancements in technology that allow us to improve recovery revolve around post-operative pain management. Our anesthesia doctors that are all board certified physicians provide our patients with a pain block while they're asleep. The pain block sets into the muscle layer and it allows patients to feel less pain and discomfort after surgery. Almost all of my patients who have had previous C-sections and then a tummy tuck will tell me that the surgery for the tummy tuck was significantly easier and less painful than a C-section. The other new technique that have, I've incorporated into my practice over the past three and a half to four years is doing body contouring surgeries, especially tummy tucks, without utilizing drains. Drains were utilized for many years in plastic surgery. Over the course of the last 10 to 15 years, surgeons have investigated and incorporated new methods and techniques to eliminate the use of drains. I have incorporated those techniques into my own practice not only to do drainless abdominoplasty in the front, but even in patients who have significant weight loss who will have surgery with me and have skin removed all the way around their waist, often termed a body lift, the techniques that I have available for me now allow me to do that procedure as well, completely drainless. The benefit to the patient is really in the post-operative period. They are able to get up and walk and have less pain and discomfort and not have to manage a drain, which then would have to be removed in the office. I've been very happy incorporating this into my surgical technique, and my patients have been extremely happy with the recovery. The other component of recovery that has been a significant improvement for patients is preoperative pain management. We typically start our patients on a regimen of medications prior to surgery to help downregulate or make their pain or nerve fibers less sensitive to surgery. By starting this ahead of the time, we're always ahead of the pain curve, and it's very rare that patients require excess pain pills beyond the normal prescription that we provide. One of the new technologies you may have seen in our facility is called LipoAI. The AI st stands for artificial intelligence. It's really a laser system. It's still operated by me, the surgeon, but it utilizes heat and laser energy in order to get better skin contraction as well as heating the fat cells and allowing them to be removed more efficiently. The benefit for the patients basically revolve around a little bit less bruising, but better skin tightening. The laser has been a great addition to my body contouring patients 
and has provided me the ability to provide excellent results for patients, especially those whose skin may be a little bit on the loose side, having the laser available to me to help utilize and get improved skin tightening and contraction has been a game changer for those middle of the road patients who may need a more involved procedure, but are wanting a slightly lesser involved procedure. One of the things that patients often find a little bit concerning with plastic surgery and cosmetic surgery is looking natural. Now, natural is kind of a vague term to some people, but the goals that we have here in the Bankston Center and at New Vista Surgical Suites is to create a very refined and enhanced contour and shape, both of the face and the body and the breasts. So that means that we're trying to achieve natural looking results that will look very good on patients and make them feel very comfortable with more confidence about how they look in a bathing suit or tight clothing. Oftentimes utilizing more than one technique, for instance, when doing an abdominoplasty, I often utilize liposuction, which removes fat from the waistline or the back or bra roll to try and enhance the result and give a natural shape, not just in the front, but all the way around the patient. This, that is just one of the many aspects that I take into consideration as a surgeon in order to achieve results that look like they're very natural and not surgical. This allows patients to feel much more comfortable about sharing their experience, but also showing off their bodies and faces when they've been properly healed. So the road to cosmetic surgery obviously starts with coming to our office for a consultation. During that consultation, you'll meet with me as well as my incredible staff of schedulers, nurses, medical assistants, and front desk staff. The consultation is very important because it allows me as a surgeon to listen to patients about their goals for surgery, their concerns, and their fears and excitement regarding surgery. During the consultation, we'll talk all about what the patient's goals are, I'll do an exam of the areas of interest and we will formulate a plan that specifically is going to achieve the best result for you. We don't do cookie cutter surgery here. I tend to make sure all of my patients receive the most comprehensive and thorough plan that's specifically tailored to her or his individual anatomy, skin quality, and desires. After the consultation is finished, you'll meet with one of my schedulers that goes over the financial information as well as scheduling. They're excellent staff and available very, very frequently to answer questions regarding surgery. Some patients will also opt to do a quick second consult prior to a surgery, especially if it's been a few months since the initial consultation and a surgery date. We definitely encourage that and I like when patients do that because it makes them feel more comfortable about the process of surgery and the upcoming surgery and oftentimes patients will leave and forget to ask a few questions. We are always available by telephone, email, as well as in person. So the recovery process after surgery is always a, a very daunting aspect for patients, and sometimes it's a barrier for patients to consider surgery. What I like to do too is dispel some of the myths that revolve around recovery from cosmetic surgery, especially in our practice here. First off, patients are up and moving right away after surgery, regardless of the procedure that they have. It takes a while to get back into moving at a quick pace, and certainly we give a time frame of expectations for exercise, but we encourage early walking and early motion. That gets patients actually feeling better and much quicker on the road to recovery. We also provide compression garments for our patients, typically in the form of an abdominal binder as well as bras for breast surgery. These help with swelling and they allow patients to feel better about their results. The more compliant and consistent that patients are in utilizing these compression garments, the better that they are gonna look early on in four to six weeks after surgery. Most patients are able to be off of their prescription medications typically within somewhere between four to seven days, even after large surgeries like mommy makeovers. And this is again relates to our tap block and our preoperative pain management.
During the recovery phase, patients will be typically awake and moving around during the day and able to engage in normal type activities. When you see me back in the office at your first visit, seven to 10 days after the procedure, we will discuss the next two weeks and then the next four to six in terms of exercise and physical activity. Many patients are very anxious to get back to the gym, and I understand that. And we want to be able to balance their desire to get back to physical activity with achieving optimal results. So techniques now have optimized the ability for patients to get back to exercise and physical activities much faster than in years past. One of the important things that Dr. Bankson and I talk to our patients about is choosing the right plastic surgeon for your goals. It's very important that patients have realistic expectations, and that's what our job is as surgeons, is to talk and educate and listen. Listening is the hard part, but it's probably the most important part of the whole process, because listening allows me to really assess what is the patient wanting to achieve, and can I help the patient achieve that through surgery. It's very important to have realistic goals about what your body will allow in terms of the result. Also, credentials are extremely important. We always recommend choosing a board certified plastic surgeon that specializes in cosmetic surgery and has experience in the area of expertise that you're seeking. Thankfully, here at the Bankson Center, between Dr. B and I, we have about 45 to 50 years worth of experience in aesthetic surgery and tens and thousands of surgical patients. Dr. Bankston and I spend many hours during the year doing continuing education and staying at the forefront of surgical techniques and technology in the world of aesthetic surgery. That way we feel confident that we can deliver the optimal result for our patients. I'd like to thank all of you for spending a little time with me today. I hope this was informative, educational, and for those of you who are considering a surgery and having a little bit of nervousness or trepidation, hopefully this will give you the courage to come in for a consultation, learn more about the procedures, and see if you're a good, appropriate candidate for some of the many procedures that I can provide for you. I would encourage all of you to stay around now. We're gonna have a Q&A session and that will maybe answer some of the questions you may have or have not thought of when it comes to surgical procedures and recovery. Hi everyone, hopefully that was enjoyable as well as informative. Uh, I'd like to open it up now to some questions. We already have a couple coming across here, so I will read the question so those of you who didn't submit it can understand, uh, know what they're asking. Um, what is the average age for someone getting a mommy makeover? Uh, well, mommy makeovers can vary in ages. Typically, I would say most patients end up being between mid to late 20s up until even into their 50s and 60s. Uh, patients are much healthier now than they have been in years past, and doing a large cosmetic surgery when someone's in their late 50s or even early to mid 60s is certainly not unusual. And with our rapid recovery techniques, it allows them to undergo the surgery and still get back to doing lifestyle <clears throat> activities that they enjoy. So the average age is probably in the mid to late 30s to early 40s, but I've seen patients that are in their late 20s all the way up to the late 60s and beyond. So it's really a matter of health and timing when um, patients decide to do surgery. We typically recommend as surgeons that patients are done with having preg uh, getting pregnant and having kids so that the result that we achieve in the operating room lasts uh, quite some time. Another question that came across here was uh, the success rate of BBL surgery. For some of you who aren't aware, BBL is a term, is an acronym for Brazilian butt lift. And really what it is, is taking fat from areas of the body that are um, not desirable to have fat, such as your abdominal area, stomach area, or your waistline, and then injecting that fat into the buttocks. And that's done to help improve some volume and fullness in the buttock area. 
it's a very common surgery and it's become more popular year over year over year. Uh, some candidates are, are patients are good candidates for the procedure, others are not. Uh, and it's based upon how much fat you have and how good that fat is gonna transfer. Typically 60 to 70% of the fat that is taken and transferred into the buttocks tends to survive and give a good shape but there is definitely some absorption over time. And we talk to patients and educate them about that. And patients may need a secondary procedure down the road about a year out to add to their volume of fat. So it's not unusual for at least 30% of the fat to go away. Where it goes is basically absorbed into your body. There's no consequences or problems from that. But we also wanna be conservative and not try and overfill buttock areas because that's when you can run into significant problems <clears throat> and complications. Another question came across, can you talk more about doing just stomach liposuction without a tummy tuck? So the answer is yes. A lot of patients come in and don't really need a full abdominoplasty or tummy tuck, and liposuction is a great solution for them. Patients who would be considered good candidates for this procedure don't have a lot of loose skin, don't have a lot of stretch marks. They may have had a pregnancy or two, but overall their deeper muscle layer is still relatively strong and intact and their skin quality is still decent. Because liposuction is very effective at allowing me to sculpt your fat and remove it, but it will not necessarily get rid of a lot of loose skin that's stretchy. So patients have to have realistic expectations about what type of skin quality they have, but many patients are good candidates to consider just doing liposuction. The incisions or the scars for liposuction are very small. They're about literally about four to five millimeters large, and they're placed strategically in areas of the body so that they're concealed in bathing suits and, um, and things like that. So patients can have a nice quick recovery. The recovery between liposuction of the abdomen versus a tummy tuck is pretty significant in that the liposuction is much faster time to back to the gym and as well as a physical activity. But that's what the consultation's for, meeting with me and discussing what your goals are and I am always honest with patients about what their skin quality will allow in order to get a good result. Many patients really want to do the least invasive thing, and I understand that, but we don't want to pick a surgery just because it has lesser scarring or quicker recovery if it isn't going to give you a good long-term result. Another question came up regarding stretch marks. What procedure is best to help with reducing stretch marks around the belly button? Well, typically when you reduce stretch marks, you really have to cut them out. There's no way once stretch marks have formed on your body through pregnancy and stretching that you can laser them or uh, do anything really to get rid of them other than being able to remove them as part of a tummy tuck surgery. I tell patients if there are stretch marks significantly above the belly button, if this is the belly button and this is the upper chest, those stretch marks will not be removed, but they're pulled down lower towards the bikini line. Almost all of the stretch marks that are around the belly button or below the belly button when a full abdominoplasty is performed are able to be removed as part of the surgery. That's an important co concept that people have to understand as well, that stretch marks really are only able to be treated or removed via surgery. But for many women, especially those who have had a pregnancy or more, those stretch marks tend to gather or cluster in areas that are amenable for surgical treatment by way of doing a full abdominoplasty. One of the topics that did come up in the discussion and the webinar today, as we wait for more questions, uh, was the uh, use of drains. And as I mentioned in the webinar, the technologies have changed in terms of understanding suture repair of the deeper layers. And many patients in the past were interested in surgery, but had a lot of concern regarding having to leave the surgery center with drains in. The techniques that I've worked on and learned from other surgeons that started actually in other countries have really been a great a um, aspect of the practice because patients feel like they're up and moving and walking and they're getting back to their normal feeling and activities much faster than they would be without having to go home and do drain maintenance and drain care. So this, along with the tap block, have made recoveries a much, much uh, lesser uh, uh, event than they were in the past, but it is important to remember that it is still surgery and there is recovery even though it's much less than it used to be. 
So depending on the level of job that you have, whether you're a stay-at-home mom or you work full-time, we have to be realistic about when you can get back to your activities and um, exercise as well as basic work type activities. Those are all the things that we discuss at the time of your consultation to make sure you're going into a surgery as educated as you can be and as comfortable as you can be. Uh, everybody attending today will receive a text at the end of this event. Uh, you can reply with the keyword body to be contacted for a consultation. Another question just came across, is it common for men to do body contouring as well? Are most of the same procedures as for female patients? Also, does the office specialize in this for men? Well, that is a great question. And roughly about 15% of my patients in body contouring, uh, between 15 to 20% are males. Uh, I would encourage patients who are interested to go on our website. I have a number of male patients on there. But the answer is yes, we do pretty much the same surgery with some minor variations for males who have lost a significant amount of weight as well as um, females because the anatomy is pretty much in essence similar. And so the goal is the same to remove as much skin as I can, to lift the buttock, to remove skin area, uh, excess skin in the front as well as arms and other areas. So we do definitely perform surgery on males and overall they have very good recoveries just like females do. Uh, now, typically we're seeing more males as more men are losing weight and becoming more health conscious. And what I remind both males and females is that the thing to remember is that loose extra skin can't be exercised away in the gym. Once you've lost weight and gotten to that healthy um, weight and activity level, the only way to get rid of that extra skin is by surgery. And so that's why it's so effective for patients to kind of put the icing on the cake in their weight loss journey. Another question, are there th specific procedures people with a hip replacement cannot have done? Uh, the answer to that in essence is no. Um, the procedures, the hip replacement being a, a much deeper area of the body, there are not issues with doing surgery uh, around that area in terms of lifting the tissue or doing liposuction um, because we're staying so far away uh, from where the anatomy is for the uh, uh, where a hip replacement would be done. So there really are no contraindications or um, things that would prevent somebody to consider having surgeries. Yep, another question that came across. Um, I had a circumferential abdominoplasty two years ago. I think there's still excess of skin that can be removed, and I believe more liposuction um, could have been done around the waistline. Can you perform a surgery a second time to yield better results? Well, the answer is yes. Um, I do a quite a bit of what we call secondary or revision surgery on patients who have had surgeries in the past and are looking to see if they can improve upon their results. Patients who have had previous surgeries um, typically are candidates, as long as you're about at least a year out and things have healed and softened, at that point we can discuss ways, uh, if possible, to improve upon the result. Again, this is where expectations have to be in line with what patients' bodies will allow, but many patients do come to see me after having a procedure done elsewhere and questioning whether or not they can achieve a little bit of an improvement. More often than not, the nice thing is when I do a revision surgery, they're typically less involved and it's really more fine tuning and sculpting the result to take it from a good result to a great result. So the answer is yes, patients can come in after having surgery. We just wanna make sure that you're at least a year out and there are no active or ongoing complications from your previous surgery because we would recommend those be uh, resolved uh, by your original surgeon before we consider doing a revision surgery. Another question regarding breasts here. Do you do fat transfers to the breast? If so, what is the su success rate of the fat content? What's the average breast size increase for this procedure? So that's a really good one. Patients are very curious about ways of enhancing your breasts without using implants. The reality is that fat transfer to the breast is still very much in its infancy in cosmetic surgery. It has very limited use in significant volume increase. So for instance, if you transfer 150 cc's to the breast or 200 cc's, only about 100 to 120 will survive. And that means that the shape and the contour of the breast is very, very minimally changed. 
And the struggle is because most women, or at least many women with relatively small breasts, simply don't have the fat reserves on their body to harvest enough fat to make a difference. In addition, the breast itself has a fairly limited capacity to take all the fat in and allow that all that fat at the time of surgery to get good blood supply and provide long-term results. The final issue that I do bring up with patients, having had this happen in the past, is that if you do fat transfer to the breast, there's always a small chance that that fat, as it absorbs in your body, can form some calcifications. And calcifications are firm areas that people typically cannot feel, but are visible on a mammogram. And the challenge with that or the concern is that if you have calcifications in the breast and you start to get mammograms or other imaging, we wouldn't want patients to have uh, to go through unnecessary further imaging or biopsies because of the concern for the calcification looking potentially like a uh, breast cancer. So uh, it's not that the fat would cause that, it's just that it could mimic it or it could make patients' mammograms abnormal. Um, so by and large, fat transfer to the breast is not uh, something I would consider the current standard of care. Most women who come in want to at least achieve one cup size, if not one and a half to two cup sizes larger increase. And it's simply very difficult to achieve that by utilizing uh, fat transfer alone. So great question. It is out there as a, a, a popular sort of um, technique, but really right now it's not a replacement for traditional implant surgery. And so I would tell patients if they're looking for a significant increase in size, uh, implants are still going to be by far the most um, effective way and the most efficient way that we can achieve that for our patients. All right. Um, regarding the possibility of having a second surgery, it was originally performed by another surgeon in Grand Rapids. Um, that's obviously we see patients here that have surgeries and facilities here out of uh, also out of the city and out of the state. So again, it comes back to really the timing of things. We want patients to be healed, healthy, back to normal baseline of health. And then we can consider doing a revision surgery at that time. Another question came in, do you need to be at your goal weight prior to having a tummy tuck? Generally speaking, um, we would like you to be as close to the goal weight or what your goal weight should be uh, based upon like BMI factors, if possible before surgery. And this is for a variety of reasons. First off, you're gonna have the best result if you have weight loss prior to your surgery versus significant weight loss after. In addition, being close to your ideal weight will also allow you to be slightly less of a risk for complications. Uh, although we don't have a hard cutoff number, I would say for most patients who are considering a large surgery like a full abdominoplasty, we want the BMIs to be around 35 or so. Patients who have BMIs above 40 and higher, generally speaking, we would recommend weight loss or other alternatives to lose weight prior to having a surgery, simply because the result will not be as good as I know it could be with improved weight loss. And the risk factors for complications after surgery are significantly higher in patients over certain BMI levels. So ideally, we want patients to be at their ideal weight uh, or close to their ideal weight. And um, that will make you a better candidate for surgery and have a, um, a better outcome. Another question um, came up, do you, just, do you do just a breast lift? How invasive is that surgery? So the answer is yes, very frequently. Uh, for many women, they're really looking to have an improvement in the position of their breasts, not so much the volume. And these are patients I'll often ask, do you like how you feel in a bra when your breasts are being supported, um, but not like how you look when the bra is off? And if the answer is yes, they like how they feel with the bra, then they don't really need an implant or volume. They really only need to be lifted. So a breast lift or mastopexy is a very nice surgery to have done. It has very minimal pain. There is scarring on the breast. It's typically a circle around the areola and then a vertical line or lollipop scar. It's not visible in a bikini or a bra, uh, but it will be visible on your body, but does fade very nicely. 
The benefit of that surgery is it allows women to feel like their breasts are higher on their chest, perkier, and all, all things considered much more youthful looking. In some cases, I take breast tissue out as well if the patients feel like they're just a bit heavy and they want to have a slight reduction in their volume and their size. So that surgery is a very popular one. Again, I would definitely recommend that you uh, go on our website. There are a number of patients that I've done surgery on for breast lifts alone, oftentimes in combination with um, other procedures, typically either with implants or with a tummy tuck and those things. So that way you can get a sense of what the breasts look like before and after a breast lift. Uh, another question, can a breast lift be done years after breast implants without disrupting the implants? Uh, the question is yes. Um, the implants can be left alone if it just needs to remove, if I just need to do a lift. And they can also be part of a surgery where we remove and replace implants. But sometimes the lifts can be performed and the implants cannot be involved in any par portion of the procedure. Another question, are there photos on the website to show scarring from implants? How often do you need to repeat surgery for new implants? That's a great question. So <clears throat> most women who get breast implant surgery, the scar is under the breast, if uh, kind of in the crease underneath. And so it's really, our goal is that you don't see the, the, in, the incision uh, with no bra on because it kind of rests at the bottom part of the breast and the implant naturally kind of sits over that with the tissue. Um, there is no specific time frame that breast implants have to be removed. So for instance, many people feel that at 10 years, they have to have surgery again. And what we tell them is that if you look fine and feel great and everything is doing well, leave the implants alone. That's not a time expiration. As they get in the, as they are in your body longer and you approach 17 to 20 years, the potential for an implant that needs to be replaced does go up a little bit. And we talk about that at the, um, consultation and we talk about the longevity or how long they last. We do tell patients they're not lifetime devices. So if you're in your 20s and you get breast implants, um, you're going to get many, many years of great, uh, um, you know, result with those. However, you will have to plan a surgery in the future. Um, and that's important to consider. Uh, but again, we're talking 17, probably to 20 some years in the future, if you're looking at just the implant. So they do have to be replaced eventually, but it's not something that's on a timed schedule. Another question about a tummy tuck. With a tummy tuck, can you choose how your belly button looks? Uh, yes and no. What I try to do for my patients is to listen to them about what they don't like about some belly buttons after tummy tucks. And I spend time going through our website with patients to often show them patients I've done surgery on and say, here's one that looks like you to start with. Here's one I think you'd look like. Patients do have some significant concerns about a belly button, which is understandable because it's very visible, even obviously in a bikini after surgery. So my goal is to create a very natural belly button that looks like it was not operated on. Ultimately, patients do all scar a little bit differently, but we try and create a belly button, I do, that's going to look the most natural for you. So more often than not, I'll talk to patients about what they don't like about belly buttons and also what they do like or what they ideally want. And if their body and their anatomy will allow me to accomplish that, then I think that that's something that we can reasonably do because many times they don't want to have a belly button that looks too vertical or like a I've heard it termed a coin slot like that. That can be a sign of a surgery or too fake round. So there are sutures that I use to kind of create an inward look and inward appearance of the belly button. And again, I would recommend that patients look at the website and um, get a sense of how the patients have healed from that. Oh, uh, another question. Are any of these surgeries beneficial during menopause? Um, in regards to that, it's really not specifically beneficial or not beneficial. It's really most of the time what patients, what time in life is right for you to have surgery, have the recovery. And so it, patients vary based upon what's going on in their lives. There's no reason patients can't have surgery during menopause. The only thing I would say would be if there is significant weight fluctuations, we'd like those to at least be stabilized prior to going to surgery so that I know as a surgeon what I'm actually dealing with and how much fat I need to remove, either with liposuction or with other techniques. So as long as your health factors are staying well, 
surgery can be done during menopause, prior, and of course, afterwards, depending on the procedure. Another question about breast lifts. What is the recovery time with a breast lift? Well, that's a very quick one. 99% um, of patients who have a breast lift will feel absolutely great by the time they see me in seven to 10 days. They're almost always driving within four to seven days. And so they drive themselves to their first follow-up. They're up walking around the house, moving, doing normal activities, like getting themselves dressed, uh, eating, drinking, pretty much independent within a matter of days. The only real restrictions afterwards that persist beyond that first week are no heavy lifting or pushing and pulling with your chest and your upper body. That's because we don't want to strain the tissues too much or potentially cause bleeding. After about three to four weeks, the restrictions are very, very minimal. Patients are then able to return to doing um, physical activity, going to the gym, as well as doing a um, workouts of that nature. So back on your feet very quickly. Back in the gym a little bit longer, but still overall not any major downtime with it. The pain level from that surgery is surprisingly for patients. They're pleasantly surprised at how good they feel after surgery and how most of them are off of their prescription pain medications within two to three days. So I just wanted to remind everybody about the text they will receive after the event and the keyword body, B-O-D-Y. And uh, hopefully the webinar was informative as well as the Q&A. And I'm excited to hopefully see some of you in office here so you and I can chat more about your body contouring goals or other questions that you may have about surgery. I'd like to thank everybody for attending this and we look forward to connecting in the future.